So good afternoon, everyone. And uh, I'm Mae St. John. I'm a head and neck cancer surgeon from Los Angeles. Uh, I recently joined the board of this outstanding organization a few months ago. I got a call from Dr. Moore, and it's really been my privilege uh, as I was sitting here today and I took a red eye out from Los Angeles and there's a lot of anticipation thinking about what things are going to be like. I can tell you that every single presentation has far surpassed even my deepest hope and expectation for where the field is and how honestly people are sharing today. Um, you know, I think from a provider's perspective, we're drawn to this field because of how personal it is where this cancer grows, in terms of how it defines us, our voice, our appearance, our relationships as to who, how we identify as ourselves. And I can tell you that having gone to medical school and residency and fellowships and all those things teaches you something, but it's really my patients who have taught me a lot. And a lot of people ask me, you know, you're often so grounded and happy, May. I mean, how do you do it? I mean, frankly, it's the gift of my patients. Um, it's the gift of seeing their courage as the inspiration. And this afternoon, we're going to be talking about stress. I think stress is something that everyone deals with in their lives. And if we just think about words that have come up today in terms of the stress of receiving a diagnosis, going through the treatment, the survivorship aspects, um, and really kind of hearing what everybody had to share really makes me think about all the stresses in terms of you know fear of the unknown. Now we have the internet, but I can tell you a lot of patients come to see me and they've done all sorts of research. Um, they don't have the background like somebody like Hannah does. And they're scared because they come in and they're like, I read this can happen, I read that can happen. Um, so a lot of times we use that analogy like having rocks in your backpack and just passing it to everybody on the team so we can support. And so I really think that this afternoon is a great time for us to kind of focus on this. We're so fortunate to have an outstanding panelist So um, our survivor panelist today is Mickey Schilling, um, and I will be introducing her in just a couple minutes. We're thrilled to have her. And our medical expert is Dr. Susan McCammon, who I'll be inter uh, introducing briefly, um, but she's a dear friend in addition to being an absolute expert in this area. I just wanted to share with you uh, an image of one of my good friends, Mara, who about 15 years ago was with her family in Wyoming, hiking and having a good time, and then she felt short of breath went to a local hospital there and was told that she had a laryngeal cancer. And, uh, you know, called up and just, you know, couldn't believe it, a young woman with her family. And really her journey has taught me so much and I just wanted to share two slides with you. The first is that she told me, you know, she and her husband were both professionals. She said they hadn't had dinner together as a family in about 15 years. Um, and after this happened, she became an avid read reader of uh, the Buddhist monk Thich, um, uh, Thich Nhat Hanh, and she shared a lot of teachings with me. And this one here has really kind of rung true, which is the mind can go in a thousand directions. You get this information, and there's, you know, what about my family, my spouse, my children, financial issues that come up. Um, but she really began to kind of focus on this and think about, on this path, I walk in peace. With each step, the wind blows. With each step, a flower blooms. And she was able to really kind of be present in a way that she felt that she and her family had not been present. And as Mark and Dr. Nathan and others said, you know, it really takes a village. Um, in our local community at UCLA, I can tell you that we call ourselves like the midnight partners because we're always emailing till midnight about every patient, the radiation oncologist, all the team play players that were described in the prior panel because there's just so much kind of thinking about what can we do, what is best. And so I really want to thank you all for providing us this opportunity to learn from you and to care together for our field and for the future of all your patients. So it's my pleasure now to introduce to you Dr. Susan McCammon, who is a professor of otolaryngology and head and neck surgery. She's the director of the Division of Head and Neck Surgical Oncology and the director of the Pat and Jean Sullivan Comprehensive Head and Neck Cancer Survivorship Clinic at the University of Alabama. Uh, Dr. McCammon has been a dear friend. She's a leader in the American Head and Neck Society, and she's going to share with you some of her expertise today. Thank you. Great, thank you. Am I on? Uh, it, is, it is wonderful to be here. 
today. Um, I feel like head and neck survivorship is really the center of my life professionally and, um, and personally. And I look forward to talking to you today a little bit about stress management. Um, I cannot really see these screens very well. Is that by design? <laughs> I mean, we just wanted to add a little stress to All right, you. yeah, a little stress. Yeah. So I need to that see my, my screens to know what I'm going to talk about, so forgive me if I turn from side to side. So I don't have any financial disclosures, but I do have this disclosure, which is that Almost all of what I'm going to talk about to you today about stress management comes as much from current research about head and neck cancer survivors as it does from my own personal experience as a doctor, a provider, a caregiver, and a patient. Um, I, I live with a lot of stress. I highly value having a trusted advisor or a counselor, and um, I can't imagine practicing in this space without that kind of support. So. Um, a little bit about what I do. So I always talk about the different hats that I wear and I finally realized my hat is actually a three-cornered hat. So I am a head and neck surgeon. I operate two days a week and have accompanying clinics. Um, but, but my heart really lies with the Sullivan Survivorship Clinic, which I'll just say a word or two about. And then I also um, am fortunate to be board certified in hospice and palliative medicine. I'm the only, only head and neck surgeon in the world, actually, to have both certifications. Although I'm happy to say two of my students are coming up behind me to share in that expertise. So I also help direct the, um, the supportive care, palliative and supportive care clinic, which covers not just head and neck, not just cancer, but all patients with serious illness at the institution that I work at in Alabama. Um, the Sullivan Survivorship Program has really was funded by Pat and Gene Sullivan. He was a Heisman Trophy winner in 1971 um, and died sadly in 2019, not from his head and neck cancer, but from dreadful post-treatment complications. And he and his wife and his children been tremendous supporters. Um, importantly, this is one of the emerging programs that treats survivorship from the point of diagnosis. You guys have heard that a couple of times today. And I think it's really important because head and neck cancer, it's not a, what I call a pajama cancer. It's not something that you cover up once you button up the bed coat or the pajama. It is quite literally in your face. And it's in your face from the beginning. And people who are cured of head and neck cancer still live with the aftermath of head and neck cancer for a lifetime. Um, the Community Access to Palliative Expertise um, program brings our expertise into a clinic, into homes. We have an extensive home visit program and we've really capitalized on telehealth so that patients get access to our counseling and our stress management and all of our supportive services whether they can come to clinic or not. Okay, I want to stop for a minute and just think a little bit about the characteristics of survivorship because again I think there are some things about head and neck cancer and the stresses that accompany it that are a little bit different. Okay, so we've talked a lot about surveillance and I want you to just think back to where that word comes from and what it really means. Okay? To surveil for something means nobody else is gonna bring it to your attention. Somebody's looking out for it because it's asymptomatic, you're not gonna notice it, it's that carotid stenosis that's creeping up on you, it is that hypothyroidism that is not going to be revealed without a lab test. Okay, that, that's not the bulk of what walks into clinic and head and neck cancer. Head and neck cancer survivors coming in saying, I can't lift my neck, I can't swallow, you know, I can't function because of my depression. Um, and so we provide ongoing support for an unavoidable symptom burden in order to make life um, tolerable and not just tolerable but enjoyable again. Um, and it's also with proactive rather than reactive. Very often, and this is true for a lot of depression and stress, we are, we, our coping mechanisms are reactive. Something bad happens and we cope with it because it's shown up, okay? And often those coping mechanisms are not, not the healthiest. When you think about a major stress happening and what are you gonna do to make yourself feel better? Okay, often, often that's where our chemical coping comes in and that may, may not be the healthiest way to deal with stress. So we really advocate for proactive planning, for protection, to recognize when you're at with risk, why you're at risk, who's more at risk, um, and to protect against that with what I call the, the bank account method of stress management. So um, I was pleased that this talk was titled stress management rather than just just depression, which is kind of where I was being, being shepherded because, I mean, we all know this, not all stress is bad, right? Some stress can be good. Um, 
You think about weight-bearing exercise to prevent osteoporosis. That only works because you're putting stress on your bones. You know, if you want your muscles to get bigger, you stress them with resistance exercises. If you want to stress something or emphasize it, an exclamation point or some bold face really grabs people's attention. So not all stress is bad, <clears throat> um, but there is bad stress. And too much good stress can become distressing. So I want you to keep in mind those two things when you think about stress management. Um, not all stress is bad. Some stress is bad. A cancer diagnosis, it's really very hard to re recalibrate that into any kind of good stress. That's a bad stress, no matter if it's little or big. Um, treatment stress, you know, the stress of treatment, that's a good stress because that's curing your cancer, but too much of it adds up and it becomes distressing, okay? So think about that, the quality of the stress and the quantity of the stress, okay? Stress is present in 100% of cancer patients. A cancer diagnosis in and of itself is a pressure that meets resistance. You don't want it and you push back. Um, some stress can be good. S too much stress causes distress. It's important because it hurts, it feels bad, but it also has negative secondary outcomes, okay? It hurts your ability to participate in treatment, prehabilitation, anything. So it impairs your compliance, and it actually has a negative impact on your cancer outcomes, on, on your cure rate, on your survival, on your recurrence rate. The chronic heightened level of cortisol and other stress hormones in the body can literally, no matter what you're personally feeling, can literally make your outcomes worse. There are both known risk factors and identifiable trigger triggers for increased stress, okay? The known risk factors are things like if your pain is uncontrolled, if you feel like you are disempowered and out of control, if you have limited access to care or socioeconomic money poverty challenges, um, if you're young, if you have substance use disorder, if you have history of trauma or abuse, sexual or physical or suicidal ideation. Now these make sense to us, um, but you can probably appreciate that these are not the easiest things to talk about early on. And it can feel like re-traumatizing or re-stigmatizing people when you say, so um, you have cancer and here's some things that are gonna happen to you. Now tell me, have you ever been sexually abused? Right, that is not an easy conversation to have. So I say that this is information that is helpful to provide in, um, an explanatory way to say there are things that can increase your vulnerability to stress and depression. Um, you may share these with me or you may keep this knowledge for yourself, but these are things that research has shown make you more vulnerable to negative outcomes related to stress management, um, whether it's bad stress or just too much good stress. And certainly there are identifiable triggers for increased stress during cancer treatment and survivorship. Um, the point of diagnosis of either your initial diagnosis or a recurrence, um, getting tests, waiting for test results. Uh, some of my patients talk about scanxiety. You know, when you have that report card coming up, that can create a lot of stress. Um, or it can create stress because your providers are expecting you to be stressed out. I have plenty of patients who are like, please don't ask me again. I'm not stressed out. I'm just going to wait until I get the results. Um, waiting to start treatment, anxiety about treatment delays. I think that's one of the greatest sources of both moral and personal distress is if you feel like your cancer outcome has been um, made worse because of a delay in diagnosis or treatment. And then certainly transitions in level of care or providers as a hospice and palliative medicine physician. I certainly see this, that when you, are, when you reach a point where there are no further cancer treatments that are available and you are passed off to hospice or palliative medicine, it can feel like abandonment and it can feel like you've somehow, you've been a successful survivor, but now you've fallen off the survivorship train and you're, you're something else. Even though you're still a survivor, it feels that way. So changes and transitions of care can be very stressful and feeling like you're losing your team, feeling like the team that we've all been talking about, feeling like that team is paying attention to you know, the other people, the surviving people, and you have some new, smaller, sketchier team that is, is gonna help you with this next phase of life. <sighs> So there are, there are instruments to screen for distress, psychosocial distress screening. The NCCN distress thermometer is probably the most famous of these. 
um, it sort of lets you say where your level of stress is and then has some topical questions about where the stress is coming from. There are some specific tools for, um, for uh, mood disorders, depression, um, financial toxicity, which is a big source of stress and distress, which is talked about not often enough. Um, but there are far more tools to screen for stress than there are providers to help treat stress. So you may well be you know, the recipient of a diagnosis at the hands of your medical assistant or your intake person who's asked you for the 10th time if you've thought about committing suicide this month. And you know, maybe you say yes, or may maybe you're pulling their leg a little bit, or maybe you just give answers that say you're at a heightened stress level. And they're like, now what do I do? So I think that it's important to know that these screening tools are more numerous than the providers to meet the need. And so if this happens, I think it's important for us all, providers and patients, to remember that you may have to advocate to say, hey, you know what, I answered this question, now you're gonna to need to do something about it. Um, the interventions that are available, I mean, there are, there are so many different kinds of stress and there's an intervention for each and every one of them. At the beginning, I em emphasized the importance of having a counselor, a trusted advisor, somebody that you can talk to about what you're going through. It doesn't have to be a shrink. It doesn't have to be a psychiatrist. Often it's not. Um, it can be a psychologist. The folks in my clinic are psycho-oncologists and social workers. Um, <clears throat> chaplains uh, do regular counseling. They also do spiritual counseling. And I just want to emphasize here that chaplaincy counseling can be for people of any faith, or no faith. This is not restricted to people who have a religious denomination or a theistic faith. It is um, talking about spiritual health and spiritual stress is really about um, your beliefs and what makes meaning, what's meaningful to you in your life, and particularly if there are conflicts between your beliefs or between your family members or between you and your care providers. Okay, so my take home message is all cancer patients have some stress can be good or bad, it depends on the degree and the culture. So this is, there are two important points here that I wanna leave you with. Stress is not an absolute value. The same event is not equally stressful across time. And the simplest analogy I have for this is getting, getting your credit card bill on October 2nd is really different from getting your credit card bill on October 31st. Right? It has everything to do with the context and the stressors that have come before. Getting a cancer diagnosis means one thing when it's your first cancer diagnosis. It means something entirely different when it's your second recurrence and there are no further treatment options. So that idea that a single stress is not the same every time it hits you, um, it's not an absolute value, it's relative to the context, leads me to what I really try to emphasize to my patients. Um, is how to, how to build resilience. Because resilience is your, is, your, is your weapon against stress. It's your ability to tolerate it, to push back against it, to bounce back from it. And if you have low resilience and you keep getting stressed and stressed and stressed, that stress residue builds up and further decreases your resilience. Now I started out by saying that some of the reactive coping mechanisms we have that we do after the stressful thing has happened are not necessarily the healthiest. Right? Because what we're looking for is not strength to resist stress. What we're looking for is comfort from stress. What we're looking for is anesthetic from feeling. What we're looking for is even avoidance because we're in a defensive position. So I try to get people to think about resilience as like a bank account. And think of it as you can add resilience points or take away resilience points. And for each and every person to think about the things that build up your resilience, the healthy good things that you can do ahead of time. You know, did I choose to eat grapes instead of Skittles today? Well, then I get a point in my resilience bank, right? And, and there's so many different examples. And I do this literally every day. Out there at that lunch table, I'm doing it. I'm thinking, what's building up my resilience versus what's, what's taking it down? If I know I have something super stressful coming up, if I know I'm about to make a big withdrawal from the stress bank, I know that I have the opportunity to make some deposits so that I'm in a stronger position. And finally, I'll just reiterate that the stress itself hurts. It's painful. Um, especially if you feel alone with it. 
Um, but it has secondary outcomes, which are it makes it harder for you to do your treatment and it makes your treatment not work as well. So treating stress is not secondary. It's not icing on the cake. It is core to your success in beating the cancer. Okay, I'd just like to point out the um, this resource in particular, the NCCN has a great um, book of resources about distress during cancer care. And I really like this quotation, which I hope y'all can read because I sure can't <laughs> from here. Um, initially, you're doing everything you can to survive. You can kind of get used to that. You're constantly fighting. And then after a while, you get a chance to pop your head above water for a little bit and look around. You see all the people who are trying to throw you um, something, throw you a line, <laughs> throw you help. Yeah, <laughs> flotation people trying to help you keep your head above water, not sink, people yelling out words of encouragement to you, and so you keep going. And I'll just close by saying, at some of my lowest points when I was talking to my counselor, she would say, and some of my lowest points or my most stressful points are actually preparing for big operations for complicated patients. And she would say, do you have enough people on your team? It sounds like you might be trying to do too much of this by yourself. Who else do you need to get on your team to make this a less stressful event in your life? So I totally advocate the, you know, the rocks in the backpack metaphor. I love that, passing out the rocks. I love the sports metaphor. I think Pat Sullivan, you know, football coach extraordinaire in Alabama, where to be a beloved football coach in Alabama, that's love, like that's unparalleled love. That's the most belovedness. Um, and so our, our supportive care clinic is really built as an umbrella model that is filled with team members. And I tell my folks, this is what we got. Some people use every single one of these things. Some people use only one. Some people say, nice, nice to meet you, nice to see all that. I'm not ready to think about it. I'll be back, you know, as we were talking about on the, on the prior panel. Sometimes it's important just to know, just to have that, that tentative timeline, that glimpse of the future, that glimpse of team members so that you know when the time is, is right there are people there to flow you float, throw you flotation. And some additional resources, I think these slides will be available afterwards. Our sponsors and my email address, I love talking about this. Anytime, any hour of the day of night, please reach out. Thank you. really outstanding, Dr. McCammon. Um, you know, I really, I like the concept of a resilience bank, and I'm going to be buying a lot of grapes tonight when I get back to LA. Uh, with three sons in the house, there's a lot more Skittles than grapes sometimes. Um, so now I just want to go back. If you can kindly just take me back to the slide, is that all right, to uh, introduce our, our survivor. Okay, perfect, thank you. So I now want to introduce you to um, a lovely woman who I met by Zoom, so thank goodness for Zoom, but really whose passion and energy just came through so much and in volumes on that Zoom. Um, this is Mickey Schilling Morris. She is a mother of three children. She was diagnosed in 2019 with a laryngeal throat cancer, and she underwent both chemotherapy and radiation treatment. Prior to that time, she had successfully and sometimes unsuccessfully uh, tried to deal with the smoking, which she'd smoked for about 20 years, and then she finally quit the day of her diagnosis. Uh, not only did she navigate the courageous battle of going through her cancer therapy, but she continues to work on managing the stress that comes with survivorship, uh, thoughts of her currents, and sometimes thoughts of the children on the school bus that she drives. So we're very <laughs> grateful to have her here today, Mickey Schilling-Morris. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, and I'm very, very privileged to be here. Um, talking about knowledge first. My mother died when I was four years old. My memories of my mother were hospital rooms that stunk terribly. Remember, I was just a child. A lot of dirt. She died at the ripe age of 34 years old of breast cancer. So that's what I grew up knowing cancer to be. So, of course, when cancer visited me, Dr. Moore, do you remember what I said to you sitting in that chair? When you gave me my diet, when you told me what was going on with me, I looked at him and I said, and I'm crying because I was all by myself, and I said, are you telling me 
I'm going to die in a dirty, dank hospital room behind a yellow plastic curtain. And he looked at me like I said, what? <laughs> <laughs> and that was, my ch- that was my lack of knowledge coming out because that's what I thought. Of course, you never knew that because I didn't explain all that crazy stuff to you. You just kind of looked at me like, no, you're not going to do that. <laughs> so I, for me, uh, stress sometimes begins with a lack of knowledge. And I think that sometimes the doctors involved in our care have to ascertain how much knowledge do I want? Because you may want more knowledge than I want, and you may want less knowledge than I want. So I think knowing the level knowledge that you want is one of the first steps that you have to address. Not saying you don't want to know. I don't mean that at all. But there's a lot of ways to amass knowledge. And you have to decide which way you're going to go to do that. Um, One of my favorite quotes is, sometimes just getting up and carrying on is absolutely the most brave and magnificent thing you can do. And with cancer, that really is the truth. Sometimes just the fact that we get up and we carry on is step one. But stress with me, um, reading, not War and Peace and not Anna Karina, (laughs) small books, sometimes with a little bit of humor in them, sometimes with a lot of knowledge in them. That helped me a lot. Um, When I felt stress building, and you can eventually just feel it starting to build, I did, um, like I say, I did a lot of reading. I did a lot of hand work to keep my hands busy. Um, I talked to people, but what I learned, I had to be very particular who I surrounded myself with because not every caring person is necessarily the best person to have around you. So I think you really do have to decide who is going to be your support group and then start picking from that support group. I, I would, in the beginning, I was very scared, and I let anybody into my support group. And um, that was not a smart thing to do because everybody kind of has little tidbits that they want to give you. So you start getting really smart and saying, okay, to eliminate some of my own stress, I've got to speak up and not be afraid to say, you're part of my group, you're part of my group. I think maybe I could use you maybe a couple months from now when I need nutritional help or something. I could use you in my group. So it took me a long time to be able to say, I don't need your help right now, you know, but maybe in the future I will need your help. So for me, that was a hard one to say too. Um, It was hard for me also to learn that the greatest illusion in life is that life is perfect. It's not perfect. And I think part of stress is realizing what you're dealing with is reality. And it's not the perfect thing that we wanted. You know, it's not the, the, the white, the night on the white horse, but it's what we got right now to deal with. Um, with me, when I feel stress coming in, I practice breathing. Getting here today, guys, I got lost three times. That's not a joke. Three times. Do you know how stressed I was? I'm driving. I'm talking to Eileen on the phone, and she was ready, Irene, she was ready to kill me. I, you were so good. You were so good. She was so patient. She said, well, it's a good thing this seminar is about stress, isn't it? Because <laughs> I'm going from Maryland Street to, to Washington Street, and at one point, and you can't make this stuff up, at one point, I'm screaming to Google, where is West Street? Honest to Pete, the woman in the car next to me, she says, keep going back that way. <laughs> so um, luckily, I think my, my vis- visitation with cancer has helped me learn to channel stress like that. There was probably a time when I would have got, came here, and the first thing she said to me is, well, you're doing really good considering how stressed out you were. And you do. You learn what, how much stress you want to spend on what. You know, because you got so much other stuff to deal with. And it's up to you how much of your life you want to spend on stress. I don't think there's a magic remedy for getting rid of stress. I don't think there's a magic group 
that's going to help you get rid of stress. I think it's here. And that's, to me, that's always the way that it always works. You have to figure out yourself what works for you. Reading works for me because reading has been proven to reduce stress and to help with relaxation. But like I say, you might want to stay away from war and peace. That's a little bit too involved. Um, I did coloring. You know, adult coloring is like a big deal now. I did a lot of coloring, you know. That was kind of good for me, too. Um, when I had stress, I would get a tremendous feeling. Do any of you ever feel the loss of control? That's what I felt. I felt unsafe. I didn't think anybody was really looking out for my personal safety. And I felt something that I have a hard time dealing with. I felt powerless. And that one ate me up. So I started learning some deep breathing exercises. A friend of mine does acupuncture, and she's really a neat person. And she would help me to learn how to do controlled breathing. Why it sounds like it's not much, it really is. It really does help you. You can feel yourself start to come down. And then I would build on that. Once I would get some of what I felt my power back, I would start building on that with just first my power, you know, then, then maybe a little more control. And, and I would slowly build on, you know, what I felt was good. Um, other than that, I don't have a whole bunch of, of, of knowledge. You've heard from the professionals. They, they have all the knowledge. I just had the common sense thing, which is, number one, be good to yourself. Oh, that is like number one. Every single day of your life, be good to yourself. And I wish I had more, but that's about all that I have. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Mickey, I, I want to thank you for sharing those powerful words um, with all of us. And it reminded me, um, shortly after the pandemic in 2021, I had a patient come to me and he said, you know, Dr. St. John, he said, the best thing about the pandemic is it's a lot like going through cancer but everybody's going through it. Nobody knows what's going to happen. Nobody has any control. I said, and now all you doctors have a first-hand lesson in what it's like to be on through cancer. And I really kind of remembered that and uh, continue to live with that. So we thank you. The second thing I wanted to tell you is my professional Uber driver couldn't find the place either. So oh, good. just wanted so to make bad. sure you're in good company. You. So I think now we're going to switch over to questions. Um, and would you like to ask some questions? Does anyone in the room like to bring anything up on the topic of stress? Uh, and then we can move Yes. Dr. McCammon? Yes. I know you have a very good support group with Jeff Barrett at your facility. How much relief from stress do your patients that go to that support group, I don't know if you're in person or still remote, uh, but how much relief do you see in your patients from being involved in a support group like that? You're asking at a sensitive time because we've just gone back from Zoom to in-person to hybrid, and so we're not getting as many participants as we did before COVID. Um, I think the people who come and participate um, really get a lot of hope and, and stress relief from it. I think that... Um, one of the things we saw during COVID when we had the Zoom option was a lot of people for whom the drive was too much were able to participate. And a lot of our, our patients um, who were more challenged with um, facial changes or management of secretions or articulation who felt self-conscious about going out and being somewhere in person felt more comfortable being to be sort of on and off screen in the Zoom environment. Um, but I also know that as we, as we get everybody, you know, everybody to come into the in-person support environment, we can do some more of the like physical stress relief, chair yoga, um, the move-a-thon. We did a, you know, we did a scarf, um, very low impact, but scarf movement thing. So I think a couple of things. I think there's an acceptance of being with a group of people um, who are not very judgy about how you speak or, or how you appear. And then um, I think being able to do some activities together is a, some physical release. Um, so I love the support group. I'd, like to, I'd love to see a group this big in our support group. I'm sitting here just marveling at how many people have come out for this and how much um, just generalized support and love I can feel in this room. 
and yes, Jeff is, I mean, he's a superstar. So I have a question as the navigator for my patients. I often see them and their families very stressed, of course. Um, I'm helping navigate them through all of their rough waters and bridging the stress topic to families, especially my male patients. I get a huge kind of, I'm fine. Um, but in my heart of hearts, I know that they're struggling. So what would you be suggesting as a way to help maybe say it different, um, encourage them to come and meet with behavioral health? Because I feel like that is a big component of mm -hmm. a lot of my patients healing, as well as going through their treatment. They struggle because they don't have someone to talk to or feel like they're alone. And mm -hmm. I don't know how to help them with that outside of telling them. So suggestions from anybody would be great. I think you're 2,000% right, and I do have some strategies. So uh, one, when I introduce it, I specify that these are counselors who are especially trained in helping people cope with serious illness, that this is not just coming in to talk about your feelings or your childhood or get generalized support, but that this is, that this is task oriented to, it's a, it's a defense strategy for your cancer treatment to building you up. Um, the other thing I do is I really, I really push it off on the caregiver stress because our, our psycho-oncologist, that whole practice is designed not just for the patient, but for the caregiver as well. And so the wife is there, you know, I don't want to be gender specific, but one partner is there saying, he's got a lot of stress. And the other partner is there saying, my stress is coming because I don't want to be a burden on, right? And so sometimes I find if you can, um, if you can get partner number one, engaged in the counseling process, then partner number two can come along and have, you know, sort of be collateral collateral support. So those are my two strategies for that. And I also present it kind of like tobacco cessation. I don't really present it as an option. I say this is a really critical part of your, of your support team and everybody does it, peer pressure. Everybody's doing it, don't you want to do it too? <laughs> Maybe you have some suggestions also, I'm sure you do. That was a good one too, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. And I could see that because a few of the groups that I attended, uh, the men were uncomfortable. And you could tell that, you know. And why some of the women, especially their partners, would try to draw them in. They had, and I often kind of wondered if they ever got turned around and were you know, part of the group. I'd left the group by then, so I didn't know. So I understand exactly what you're saying. I think another powerful tool that we got from um, Bill Lydiot and his research group in Nebraska was research showing that prophylactically starting um, a mild antidepressant at the point of diagnosis, whether patients had a, an objective diagnosis of major depressive disorder or not at that mm -hmm. time, led to better outcomes. And so that is, I mean, I, I deploy that all the time. I just say this, we know that this leads to better outcomes. Let's just try it. I think from a male perspective, um, you know, I have a memory of um, the social worker coming in and me having no interest in speaking to the social worker. Um, and then I have a memory of the chaplain coming in and me having no interest in speaking in, to the chaplain. Um, and so I think over time, though, if you keep at it, there's going to come a point where someone's ready to do it. And I don't think there's a whole heck of a lot of value if someone's not at a point where they feel comfortable doing it. Um, but uh, to some of the points just made, you know, over time, especially maybe uh, leaning on the partner for, for help, um, it does eventually, I think, for a lot of people, probably for me, I know it was, come to a point where it's like, okay, I'm, I'm comfortable with this. And then not, not everybody's comfortable with the same thing. Um, I was 30 years old, I had no desire to be in a group. Um, I had no desire to be with a bunch of people who were like me, um, because I didn't think there were very many of them. Uh, so for me, it was more individual, and it just took time. And so I think um, just keeping at it and giving people time from my perspective is what worked for me. I have a, do you wanna make a comment about this? Yeah, go ahead. I did not go to a support group during my treatment and I wish now looking back that I would have, but it wasn't really ever, it was presented to me I think one time and there were signs in the hospital, but then COVID hit, so then it went virtual, and I just had no desire, like he said, to sit around and talk about it with people that 
had the, you know, everyone's, then I'd be sad for them, you know? But the, now looking back, I'm like, no, that's not what would have happened. I think that we would have learned from each other and, and probably would have taken some of the stress off my husband, you know? And um, also I do use medication because I had crippling anxiety um, thinking about dying all the time. <laughs> Yeah, I think that um, support groups can do a, a whole lot of different things for lots of different people who are involved. And sometimes the easiest to interface with are the informational ones, kind of like some of the things we've talked about today. You know, what kind of foods do you make that help this better? What what do you do when this problem crops up? And it can be it can be informational. And then as you develop friendships and relationships, there can be more you know um, personal sharing or support. So there's got to be a mix of those. Just to comment this time, I think uh, for me, as uh, so all of the inter important relationships with other people are essential, but sometimes you just can't even do that. And to me, at the basis, the thing that's been the most important to me has been walking. And I walk at least 10,000 steps a day, and, uh, and it not only helps me physically, but the endorphins that come from it. And I began walking about 10 years ago when I got a diagnosis uh, of leukemia and the doctors, uh, this was in South Dakota where you know how those people are. Anyway, uh, anyway, they told me I was going to die very soon from it. And I didn't. But I thought at the time, I'm dying. And they told, I said, what can I do? And they said, there's nothing you can do, no diet, no, nothing you can do for it. And I thought, well, I'll just die with as good a body as I can have. <laughs> and I started walking, and I haven't stopped since. So when I found out this cancer, I thought, oh, I can walk through this one. Well, it's not a walk, but it has helped all the way along. It's helped my spirit while I was in the hospital to walk, and it's helped ever since. And that's one thing you can do for yourself when you don't feel like you want to talk to anybody else. Sometimes. Excellent. If that's not a, a resilient approach, I don't know. That's mm -hmm. really remarkable. <laughs> um, Dr. Brooke, Dr. Brooke has here has a question. I found uh, the hard way uh, uh, when, uh, about those issues when I got the diagnosis. Cancer. 17 years ago, I had to deal with mortality. I always felt invincible. And then this around the corner, uh, you had to deal with uh, uncertainty about the future, uh, worrying about every test, uh, the, the CT, the MRI, the Biopsies. How do you deal with uncertainty about the future and the anxiety about it? How to accept it is a process that takes time. After a while, I just accepted it, and I am less stressed about it. But it took time. And the depression. How do you deal with it? Should I give up or should I keep going? For me, what helped me, and it may be different for every person, I thought, okay, I can give up, but this is a message I would like to leave my children. When things are bad, you give up. No. And for me, help me to, uh, to go back to work, to help other people. And... Uh, as a physician, I became a better one. I became more compassionate. I could see how other people feel when they have a stressful event in their life. 
also learned. Uh, I was unfortunately in a several wars, several wars in my life. pretty powerful, another remarkable analogy um, to think about. One more question. Okay, I'd like to uh, second what the last two gentlemen said. Uh, one of the challenges with walking at first was it's lonely. Walk with your spouse, walk with your kids, walk with your dog. Uh, I walk with several friends every morning, five miles before breakfast. If they're not there, I listen to podcasts. And as the commercial on TV says, there's a podcast about everything or anything. <laughs> and uh, you know, if you get desperate, you can always listen to your favorite music. Uh, I think the big thing that I've learned is uh, from my teaching experiences, what I always told my students is nobody does anything without incentive. And so you have to have an incentive. Well, you know, you've got your family. Uh, your friends, and my wife has uh, Parkinson's, so I'm her primary caregiver. She's incentive number one. I've got grandkids. I'd like to see their way through, through school, high school, get a job, and it's got to take a while. So I've got to be uh, physically prepared, and all that helps. You know, all, all these activities help uh, be involved with church, I substitute teach, so I have like uh, 3,000 kids in my, my town of 10,000 people who all know me, and I can't go to uh, the grocery store without kids come up dragging their parents <laughs> with them to introduce their parents to me, the world famous substitute teacher. <laughs> so, That's so, so nice. Just get a good incentive, motivation to keep you going. That's that's. To you. And walking helps. Thank you so much. I think finding joy in whatever that is, whether it's our work, if it's our environment, it could be um, just a good thing happened that day and just reminding yourself. We have a question from online, um, and it, it ties into what Jessica and Dr. McCammon had mentioned about antidepressants. The question is if you could discuss the role of an antidepressant or an anti anxiety medication for stress management. Sure. Um, so certainly there, there are criteria, there's a list of criteria that, um, that define what a major depressive disorder is or when, you know, sadness and hopelessness and the feeling of despair or that things are not going to get better, you know, starts to creep beyond a day or two or three days to every day for two weeks. Then that, that becomes, you know, a, a psychiatric condition that is probably not going to get better without some medical intervention. So I think being alert to when stress tips over into into um, into depression, um, that's important for patients to be aware of, and also for providers to screen for. Um, the main antidepressant medicines that we use now, not the only ones, but the the, the predominant ones are the um, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors and their side effect profile is pretty predictable and controllable. Um, and uh, there are not too many like crazy dangerous side effects. So it's pretty safe to trial people on them until you find one that can be effective. Um, the, those antidepressants, also some of them have anti-anxiety components as well, but they work over time. None of those medicines are effective right away. It takes one to two to three weeks for them to be effective. Um, sometimes you need intervention faster than that, 
There are fast-acting anti-anxiety medicines like um, Xanax or Ativan, which are probably the top two medicines used. Both of those um, can result in physical and psychological dependence, so we're a little bit more cautious about using them routinely. Um, but they certainly can be effective, uh, definitely in the context of pretreatment um, medication for, for radiation treatment, which can be so um, you know, claustrophobic and, and frightening and uncomfortable. So I think those are probably the two primary places I see those medications used. Um, if you're intolerant of the medicines, there are multiple other classes which are less popular now, often because they're generic and not making anybody a ton of money, but don't give up. There are alternatives and we can usually find a medication that can be effective. I think that depression is an example of good stress that's just added up to the point where it's not manageable anymore. You just become crippled with an overload of stress. Um, and in the same way that you have to manage stress in order to be able to live life and successfully com complete treatment, if you have severe depression, you really have to treat that in order to kind of creep back up to the point where you can start to manage regular stress and you can start to participate in life again. So in the same way, when I have patients who come to me and their pain is uncontrolled, they're sitting in my office with 10 out of 10 pain, that is not a time we can do effective decision making. You've got to get the pain under control before you can talk to somebody and ha engage their values and their reason about their decision making. And severe depression is the same way. I'd also like to just make a point about the uh, great import, at least with the ones I've worked with, of mind and body psychologists. Um, they do hypnosis for our patients. To be honest with you, they do interventions for the care providers because I think a lot of the journey of being a patient is similar to the journey of many of the care providers in terms of really thinking about um, what's best and thinking about the unknown and how to manage it. Um, and so I think that really kind of finding those members of your team, as Mark said, is really invaluable. I was wondering, Mickey, you had shared with us a little bit about your personal journey, your history of knowing cancer as a four-year-old girl, and then kind of coming to terms with that in the office. And I think as patients and maybe people in the audience want to share are being told you have a cancer diagnosis, and sometimes there's miscommunication around it. A patient will come see me and they have a cancer diagnosis, and I'm under the impression that the doctor on the outside has already shared this with them, and sometimes it's the first time that you're telling them this. What can you describe a little bit of the stress you feel, and then what could mitigate it in the moment? If anything. I'm going to say probably for the first, what I thought was a huge amount of time, I felt nothing but stress. Um, the other part that I didn't mention, because everybody comes across their diagnosis different, mine was rather strange. I had this little bitty, little bitty tiny lump right here, S size of a pinhead. It was nothingness. And I was the type of person when I was going to the doctor, I'd make a quick note, you know, to say, oh, this, 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 or this. And um, my doctor was on maternity leave. So I had this other young, you know, I thought, really young guy, know it all, came in. And he says, I understand you, have a, you usually have a little list. And I said, well, yeah, I do. And he says, what's on your list? And I said, well, I said, I got this little bitty tiny pinpoint knot right here. And um, he says, I'm going to go have you, uh, that's going to be tested. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. And I'm thinking, yeah, he's going to make a name for himself with me. There's nothing wrong with me. He was a genius. Mm -hmm. I sent him a thank you because he probably saved my voice by sending me and having things done that quickly and see I was so stressed over the whole thing and I really thought he was way out of line but no he was not out of line at all and all that stress I felt over it uh, dissipated very quickly because he was absolutely correct and that was exactly everything that had to be done um, for the stress um, I immediately started with the stress group with a group that someone turned me on to the local hospital. And it was all women. There wasn't a man in the group. And it wasn't just cancer patients. It was actually a stress group. People that simply felt they were out of control and couldn't deal, you know. And um, I think that helped me in the initial. I think initially that helped me to kind of center myself 
and to realize who I was and where I was going from that point. So that helped me. Excellent, thank you. Any other questions or anyone want to share anything else? Um, Susan, I know you did share some of the um, references and places where people could go. Um, when patients come to see you, what are you sharing with them during that visit uh, in terms of resources? And are there a few go-tos that you would kind of leave us with? Mm -hmm. Sure, so when I, when I see folks in um, the head and neck cancer clinic, when I'm diagnosing a patient, I will usually introduce them to both the, you know, the survivorship clinic and the supportive care resources, the umbrella picture with all of the services mm -hmm. underneath. You know, with the expectation that these are not things that you'll need all at once, but these are things that are available. Um, and then the uh, NCCN pamphlet, I share that with them. The um, H and HNCA um, flyers, those are resources that I share as well and, and the website for that. And then I do try to get them involved in the head and neck support group. Thanks. Yeah. Well, I really, I just want to thank everyone for sharing today. I also want to share with you that there's someone named Z here today. Z, can you stand up? Mm -hmm. Z is not here. Well, Z just decided to join us today. Maybe he stepped out of the room, but flew out from New York today just to be here because he was so moved. And so I think that's really the kind of power and, and passion that this group has to make things better, to give head and neck cancer a voice. and. I try to teach my residents that, you know, as precise as surgery is and medicine's supposed to be, you know, having this diagnosis, going through it, whether you're the patient or the provider, is never pre precise. But that's really what makes it human and makes it worthwhile for us to all be together here today. So I want to thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you. 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 Thank